you're probably all wondering what's this all about, what's the catch, here I am giving you stuff and you're thinking there's got to be something uh, in this that you're not really appraised of. Well, all I can tell you is there's no catch. Uh, one of my intellectual heroes, Seth Godin, says ideas that spread win. Um, I think that we've cottoned on to a particular idea in a certain way of thinking uh, and I want to share it with you and then afterwards basically open the, uh, the floor for discussion. So I really don't have that much to, uh, to present to you beyond the video and what uh, results from the, uh, the exchange that we're going to have. So if we turn the lights down please and make sure the volume is up and let's watch the video. It's just 15 minutes. I'm Stephen Barnes, co-founder of the Hong Kong Visa Centre. Five years ago, after trying to upkeep a forever failing business, I almost became bankrupt. So, out of necessity, in 2011, I set out to change the way I do business. I really needed to. I was going under. The journey I travelled in the last five years has been a revelation. You see, Against all the odds and starting with nothing, by 2017, we've created the conditions for a monopoly in our space, Hong Kong immigration. Make no mistake, we have significant and very well-resourced competitors, but by being nimble-footed, standing out and doing things differently, a monopoly awaits us in our service niche. And by focusing on a single competency, and learning how the internet really works, we began to lay the foundations of the Hong Kong Visa Center business and inadvertently created the genesis of a monopoly in our niche. And you can too in yours. In my next video, I will urge you to do the thinking to make it happen. The first step in building any monopoly is to seriously do the thinking. I found myself inspiration and guidance in the writings of various people in building my monopoly. I took inspiration from the words and wisdom of my intellectual heroes, Don Tapscott, Seth Godin, Kevin Kelly and Charlie Munger, some of which I'll share with you later. My business partner and I analysed the competition in the Hong Kong immigration marketplace. There were two major competitors in the market. One was a company I'd been a founding partner in, while the other was the world's largest immigration practice for whom I had previously worked. So, I knew their strengths and their weaknesses. I also knew the market was split between two service sectors, 15% in the individual services sector and 85 in the corporate services sector. And from my experience, I knew that the first 15% consisted of people having problems that no one else was properly addressing. So we decided to re-enter the market in the individual services sector first, where we would be competing against non-consumption. Our aim would be to produce high quality content, giving people answers to their questions and help solving their problems, all for free. Sounds crazy, right? Well. Soon you'll find out that it's not just as crazy as it sounds. In business, we'll always have competition, and choosing to be different is the only way to stand out above the rest of the market. When we began setting up the Hong Kong Visa Centre, we had two basic principles in mind. These were two principles put forward by the great Charlie Munger. The first of Munger's principle was that to be successful, you have to do one thing and if you can do it better than everybody else, success is guaranteed. The second was to apply the golden rule to all of your relationships. This is to treat other people in the same way you would wish to be treated yourself. These were our foundation stones when setting up the Hong Kong Visa Center. Next, we drew on the marketing genius of Seth Godin who says, to get people's attention these days, you must be remarkable, be outstanding. So, we decided it would certainly be extraordinary to give away all of our intellectual property for 
free to anyone who wanted it. That's 20 odd years of accumulated Hong Kong immigration knowledge and know-how. So we used our experience and knowledge to imagine every possible question, problem, scenario and idea that could arise within our niche of Hong Kong immigration. And we wrote it down, creating the Hong Kong Visa Handbook. No one else was doing that. But my philosophy is, if information is going to be free, it may as well own free. Once we decided to give our information away for free, we then had to decide how best to go about doing it. We needed to build a platform in order for anyone to access our information easily at any time on demand. We reached out for the free open source content management system called WordPress. Now you have to realize that at some point the mighty Google is going to be sifting its way through your material looking for the best stuff to guide people to. So you have to make sure your taxonomy is right. It's vital that you get this nailed so that the search engines know exactly what you offer. WordPress enables you to do this. We've learned that in today's connection economy, you have to be generous. Consequently, our websites invite people to engage with our materials, to reach out and ask questions, which we answer via our blogs. We've come to understand the common experiences and tasks involved in our niche, so we publish online do-it-yourself kits for free. By giving away all our experience and know-how for free, we create close relationships and generate goodwill. The next step in building a monopoly can be expressed in just a few words. Nevertheless, it's vitally important. You must be totally transparent. My story is on our website for everyone to know. As an immigration advisor, people are opening up all their personal details to me and pretty much putting their future lives in my hands. So I believe I have an obligation to reciprocate the trust that they place in me. To create and maintain effective relationships, you have to be transparent. You must tell people your own personal story. Show them that you're authentic and trustworthy. And above all, let them see that you're vulnerable, just like they are, just like we all are. I learned very quickly from the beginning that most of what you hear about search engine optimization doesn't apply to many businesses. It's mainly a bunch of propeller heads attempting to outfox Google. This is okay for a few niches, but it's futile for mine, and especially for professional services. So, when building our business model, we use WordPress to mount the platform for our core content site, the Hong Kong Visa Handbook, and our daily content update site, Hong Kong Visa Giza, and the Hong Kong Visa Center. We sell nothing on the first two sites. Instead, we publish content in straightforward language, providing answers and solutions to problems, which leads to the third, where we have conversations, form relationships, and offer our professional service. It's a simple strategy. Make your material widely and freely available to those interested in your niche by anticipating all their questions that could be asked about it, answer them, and cultivate relationships. In the end, all roads lead to Rome. In order to sell something, you need to know what you're selling. Obvious? Well, it's essential for you to leverage your platform and disrupt your marketplace, and you need to find a way to sell stuff that your competitors can't. 
We knew from experience that the traditional way of selling immigration services is through fear. You say to clients, I've got this knowledge and know-how, and if you don't pay me, you probably won't get your visa. And then what are you going to do? Now, you don't have to read Robert Caldini's Secrets of the Science of Persuasion to know that fear is a terrible basis for any relationship. But if you do read him, you'll learn how to harness the psychological hardwiring that we've all evolved. You see, we realized that what we were selling was peace of mind. By giving away all of our knowledge and know-how to people who need it, by being open and transparent, we've engendered our authority and we've established their trust. Also, because of the relationship we build with people, we know enough about them to only take on those applications that we genuinely think will succeed. So, in that regard, we can offer a 200% money-back guarantee, and people employ our services because they're buying peace of mind, not a visa label and a passport. A few years ago, I found myself aboard a ship on a four-day Disney cruise in the Caribbean with my family. I was astonished by the customer service experience that Disney provided. It was no Mickey Mouse affair, it was absolutely second to none. And it made me realise that if you're in control of a particular environment, as the Disney Corporation were on that ship, then you can lay out a complete experience for people. If you understand what sort of experience is going to resonate with your audience and then you deliver a customer service experience encompassing it, you basically have achieved total market alignment. By understanding our potential clients, by understanding all the potential scenarios they'll face during the immigration process and by answering all their questions, solving all their problems for free, we're providing an unrivaled customer service experience, an absolutely essential step towards building a monopoly. While it's vitally important to propagate your online proposition, it's just as vital to take your offline proposition as far as you can into the wider world. Seth Godin calls this unleashing the idea virus. My idea virus was born about 15 years ago. Once a month I'd go on RTHK, the public radio broadcaster in Hong Kong, to take calls, answer questions and generally talk about immigration issues. The host, Phil Whelan, took to announcing me as Stephen Barnes, the Hong Kong visa geezer. I thought, that's good, that's catchy, that's something people will really remember. Which is important because immigration isn't a live idea in most people's minds every day. But when the issue does crop up, it's crucial. And if the first thing that pops into their heads is the visa geezer, that'll be the first thing they search for online. From that, you can build what Seth Golding calls a tribe. Combine the two and you have a tridea virus with which to build your monopoly. Our tribe is currently 150,000 strong and growing. By now, I'm sure you're asking, so have you built your monopoly yet? Well, it's no secret, not yet, although we're very nearly there. We already enjoy a monopoly on content in the immigration niche and have a 50% market share on one type of visa. But as Peter Thiel says in his book Zero to One, you need to have a secret. We continuously follow a checklist derived from Thiel's book as follows. One, do we have an engineering advantage? Yes, in my losing years, I learned how to convert Microsoft Outlook into a sort of electronic file effect. This gave me insights into how others organize their backends and so how to organize ours. Two, was the time right? Yes, because I was broke, but also because our competitors were still doing the same old thing. So the opportunity to disrupt the market was ripe. Three, were we starting with a small share of a big market? Yes, and we were competing against non-consumption. Four, do we have the right team? Yes, my business partner of nearly 20 years and I can read each other's minds by now. We recruit the right people and we treat them with respect. We follow the golden rule, so they like working for us. 
five. Is your distribution organized? Yes, we nailed that from the get-go through our business model by design. Six, will our position be defensible in 10 to 20 years from now? Yes, absolutely, because we publish four or five times a week and the more we publish, the more difficult it is for our competitors to steal our thunder. We've made three million US dollars in the first five years and built a tribe of 150,000 strong. All because of this, we found our secrets. Lots of them. If you follow this approach in your niche using your experience, you'll develop secrets that give you an angle that your competitors don't have. There are lots of secrets out there. You need to do the thinking and find them. So we've got a whole list of questions here that we've received online. Let me see what we... Uh, okay. Um, you said that you started with no money, no equipment and no staff. So how did you know that this was the thing that you should focus on moving forward? Well, when I started the Hong Kong Visa Centre in 2010 going into 2011, I knew that business was going to be based on content because um, I was successful with content between 1996 and 2000 uh, when the internet was first getting going. Um, so it was a no-brainer for me that the Hong Kong Visa Centre business model was going to be based on content. So that gave me the confidence to know that I'd be successful. The key was how can I produce acceptable quality content given that I had barely any resources uh, and then begin to parlay the expertise and the knowledge in such a way that it answered people's questions and helped them solve problems. And, uh, and out of that basically grew all the commercial sort of activity that followed. Can you offer any advice for people who are just starting out to utilise the power of the internet for their business? Well, like the refer in the movie, uh, if information is going to be free, you may as well own free. So if there is a, a vacuum of information uh, in the particular niche that you, know, you have expertise in and you understand the kind of questions that people are asking in relation to that niche and that information isn't available on the internet. Uh, if you can find a way to um, answer those questions and solve those problems using cost-effective content techniques which are very cheap when all is said and done, uh, you've, uh, you've got the, the, the basis of, uh, of a way to go about um, monetizing that using different ways about thinking you know, how your market operates. So how often do you publish and how do you come up with the ideas for the topics? Well, when you, when you map the taxonomy, you lay on your taxonomy, you, you understand sort of in visual, in a visual sense what the whole thing looks like in language, the vernacular, right? Um, and once you know essentially what you need to say within that content sort of proposition, you then ask yourself, well, what are the top 100 questions that most people would ask you about you know, this particular array of material? Uh, and then just develop additional content on top of the original content that you put down that, that speaks to you know, the, the essential vernacular of the, uh, of the niche. Thank you. So is there anything you'd do differently if you were starting from scratch again today? No, I don't think there is. Um, the whole, the whole, this whole experience for me was just derived organically through need and necessity and understanding that I know my marketplace really well and I know what my competition's all about. So I knew their strengths, their weaknesses. I knew what I was capable of achieving with a certain set of resources. Um, and I think if you sort of begin your journey understanding that thing and then do the kind of reading uh, and the watching of good stuff on the web that I've done down the years and take on board all these ideas. You can begin to look at what your niche is all about through a different prism and then you can come up with, as Don Tapscott says, you have to disaggregate and re-aggregate value in the connection economy. Um, and so if you've got a really decent command of your niche and you know how everybody else is doing it and you think you've got an alternate way of being able to deliver new value but still of equivalence um, then, then, then that's how you go about doing it. But you've got to do it organically. Yeah. 
So in yeah. the video I noticed you recommended the book Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Well, it's a very famous book, right, yeah. based on uh, a series of Stanford lectures that big wigs from Silicon Valley uh, used to contribute to. And he was one of them. And he was the, in, in his presentation, I think it was 2012 when he gave it, he was the first person I'd ever heard come up with the idea that actually monopoly is the, the ultimate end state. Um, when you're thinking through a new business in today's connection economy, mm -hmm. you've got to think about it in such a way so that you can command the natural dynamics and forces of, of the marketplace to work in your favor. And if you do that properly, you know, you should be doing it in a way that very quickly early on precludes others from coming in and competing against you. Mm -hmm. So you end up just through the natural order of how things unfold with a monopoly over time. So any other books that you'd recommend? Well, I'm sure there's lots. Well, yeah. Um, Focus by Al Rees, that was the book that I read in the early, in the mid 1990s that taught me to specialize in one thing. Um, there's, a, there's a book out these days, this uh, recently called uh, Expert Secrets, um, which is uh, really all about how to communicate effectively uh, and with a simple technology to support uh, that, that communication. That's really uh, part of the science of persuasion element of, yeah. of, of contrived. Uh, developing a new so business maybe model. you could write a blog post with a list of those books? And well, actually, no, they're, they're all on my blog. There's a section called um, Intellectual Heroes, and it's okay. all there. So yeah. it's oh, every right. time I, uh, I sort of pick something up that I think is important, I add it to that mm -hmm. post. Um, what, what is your method of converting from free information seekers to paying uh, clients? What's the method? I mean, are, are you just, do you just say, like, if you need a personalized case, then get in touch. Or, what? I'm just curious how you move them from just seeking free information to wanting to pay you for more. Well, okay. The starting premise behind that is that in the immigration space, there are two types of customers: there are those that want to pay and those that don't want to pay. And those that don't want to pay used to be kind of a liability to the business because they come into your conference room, they kick the tires, you spend an hour of your time, you never see them again. And in 1996, when the internet came alive for me and I put the first version of the Hong Kong Visa Handbook, I could solve that problem straight away of the kind of tire kickers because when they're on the telephone, basically wanting to come in and see me for a free consultation, I could at that point say, well, no, I'm happy to do that. But firstly, I want you to go on a website and read all about this visa type because everything that you need to do this application without paying anybody like me for free is there for you. Uh, what that meant was that when ultimately people came into my office, they had already sold themselves on the idea that actually they, sh they wanted professional help. So they'd moved themselves from, those, from the realm of those that don't want to pay into the realm of those that do want to pay. So these days, the same phenomenon applies. So by the time people come in to see me, they've had such an exposure to what is the solution to their problem on our websites, and they've concluded that really they want to have somebody to help them do it. So there's no sale as such, it's just a case of, well, tell me your problem, can I think I can fix it? If I think I can fix it, I'll make you an offer of services that are on very, very good terms, and if those are acceptable, then you know, we'll, we'll represent you professionally. Uh, and that's not a sales closing process, it's just a natural part of the conversation that we have towards empowering people to make a decision about you know, what their problem is and how they best go about solving that problem. So they, they kind of segment themselves well, I think the pre you, pre you pre qualify yourself because by the time you finish dealing with us on the web, you've got everything you need to do it yourself. But there's no need to engage a professional at that point. It's, it's all within your grasp, easy to do. So you've essentially determined at that point are you in the realm of wanting to pay or not wanting to pay? So uh, it's, it's a, the market organizes itself naturally. And that's what's so good about this method because. You know, our conversations are all about a relationship. It's not about, you know, I'm trying to pick your pocket or, you know, get the best possible value out of you that I can in what I perceive to be transactional value at this point. I want relationships with people because, you know, in the immigration space, you get to know people intimately, personally. Um, and so I think it's important that you deal with people on the basis of trust and respect. Uh, and that, you know, honestly is always the best policy and I think that applies very much so in the connection economy where you can't hide anymore, right? You know, if you, if you want one bad instance of your reputation gets out there, yeah. So you're forced to be, you know, honest and ethical, I believe. And it's easy to transact on that basis. Hey. Hey. 
So in your time in Hong Kong since starting your model, have you seen, based on the fact that you have to have ultimate knowledge in a specific niche in, in the market, have you seen other spaces where you think you could apply the same model? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the two dynamics to that is that firstly, you have to be an expert in the niche, right? And there's only one niche that I'm expert in, and that's immigration, right? You might say that that dovetails into my, the second part, which is my emerging expertise, which is sort of this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I can see immediately how you could take what we're doing and apply it into any number of niches. You mentioned on a couple of occasions that the first thing to do is to uh, envisage all of the questions that might be asked by your customers and to write down the answers. Um, I work in a slightly different space where I probably have to find answers to questions that haven't been asked before. So, or problems that are potentially so complex that it's not as simple as saying, well, what's the question and what's the answer? Um, and so I'm sort of thinking how, I think you said it was possible to apply this to all businesses. Even the, the thinking definitely can be. Whether it manifests itself in an exact replica of how we've done it, I, I doubt that. I yeah. think there are different nuances yeah. to every niche. I think what I, what I picked up on, you said, uh, yeah, firstly, do the thinking, but essentially get people's trust, I think you said. That's part of the process, yeah. yeah. And I think... Get, get peace of mind. Yeah. So if, if they, if they have peace yeah. of mind that you know you can help us this as far as possible on a you know, free offer basis, um, but then the step to paid service uh, probably comes at a different stage in the process. So disaggregate yeah. and re-aggregate value. Yeah. Under know what you sell, understand yeah. what problem you're solving, what people are coming to you for, how can you deliver value that means something to them, even if you've had to reconfigure it to get it to get into their hands. As long as it makes sense for them to do it in that fashion, yeah. then, then you might be able to get away with it. Yeah. The, the, the connection economy has just changed the way that uh, the businesses are oriented in the industrial era. It was really all about basically producing things, and it was about control and replaceable parts. Prior to that, in the agrarian era, it was all about relationships. So we went from relationships into this sort of corporate, industrialized, matrix-type method of how we conduct and organize ourselves into a point now where, through the web, we can have a relationship with 7.2 million people, right? It is, they're available. And that, that essentially changes everything in terms of how you can go about delivering value out of you as a human being into somebody else or a particular organization or a party that's got a need that you know exists within you that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Hi. Hi. Um, have you seen sort of organic growth throughout the business or was there a tipping point at some point? Um, there was no tipping point. There was a time about three and a half years ago when my business partner and I uh, declared victory. We knew that we were on to a winner. Um, it was just steady and incremental. Steady and incremental, which is the best kind of growth. It took us six weeks to get our first set of paid instructions from the first content that we put on the web. Uh, and we basically haven't stopped selling since. And we've kind of, we, we've changed our orientation to our perception of the marketplace. We no longer see the marketplace as being um, a series of individual transactions, people with visa problems that we might be able to sell a solution to. We don't think like that now. What we believe is that there is a community um, that have a problem that we are very well positioned to help them solve those problems. And so we'll do everything that we can to encourage those problems to be solved and that will then essentially mean that whatever revenue is out there, we would hope if if, if we've done our job right, it will come towards us rather than to our competitors. So it just from a day-to-day -day perspective, it rains clients. It's unbelievable. Just, when I wake up in the morning, I have no idea you know, how many new clients we're going to have during the day, but it's just incessant, incessant. Lena. Um, it's very interesting Great. from your experience. And I know you've uh, made your business bulletproof. But have you, well, what has been a difficult case and how, how you managed to, to, to make it work? A difficult immigration case, and you manage it with a relationship with the client. 
Well, the first thing that I do if there's a problem with the client is I give them their money back. Whatever, whatever stage we're in, is, they'll just give you your money back. That's not a problem because it's not about money. It's about doing the right thing. Um, and I found that if you just apply honesty and earnesty and transparency and let them know that whatever the problem is, you're doing everything that you can to fix it. Uh, and that's the best that you can do, and that's what people expect. So we treat other people like you would hope to treat yourself. It's a simple way of solving problems. And, 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 and the interesting thing about that is that so few other businesses do that. You know, whenever problems emerge, they run for the hills and they don't want to take responsibility. And I don't get that. It's counterproductive. Steve, uh, first of all, thanks for helping me out in the past. Oh, you're welcome. I seven years, I finally got my PR here. So. But anyway, um, I, I see a business primarily internet driven. Uh, am I correct in assuming that? Well, it isn't as much as you absolutely need to have, you need the internet to be able to parlay your proposition and, and reach out to people. Yeah. Right. Do, do uh, a certain percentage of your uh, your paying customers come from outside of Hong Kong? Um, well, we don't we don't gather our metrics in that particular way at the moment. We will we'll be able to at some stage in the future, but at the moment we don't really look at that. Um, it's very difficult to judge where our business comes from because we've got so many points of contact in the community now, and the web presence got ten thousand pieces of content on, and the traffic just grows all the time. Uh, by the time somebody actually gets to us and they're ready to impart their money to us, uh, they kind of know us already through one source or another. So whether it's through a personal referral or they've heard around the houses that we're a firm worth dealing with or they've come on the website and they've had you know, the problem solved or whatever, it's just really difficult to know the origins of the business. We ask, of course, but you don't learn a lot when I say, have you heard about us from the web? And they just sort of say, yeah, uh, I saw your website. But I, I've a search for it, somebody's put them onto it, I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the, good, the good news is I don't really have to worry about that because I, s I suppose we could try and tweak and, and, and encourage that to sort of drive more revenue, but organically it's, it's fine, right? Literally it just happened. We, we're, we're lucky because we can boost content. We've got such a, a deep and wide array of content. When I think that the community needs to hear something that's important about immigration, I'll, I'll boost it on Facebook. Uh, and we know that every visitor that we get at the moment is worth 83 Hong Kong dollars to us on, on our site. And I can buy a, a visitor for 30 cents uh, Hong Kong through Facebook. So it's in massive leverage to be able to you know, increase the prospect revenues and, and, and get more and more people aware of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Will? So as a follow on to that, what yeah. have you learned about search engine optimization? And obviously your customers can come from all over the place, but the web is a big part of that. What's the sort of core driver behind it? Well, there's two, two things to appreciate, right? There's, there, are, there, are, there are two properties on the internet that you can use that you know you're going to be successful with. One's Google and the other is ultimately Facebook. Right. So when it comes to Google, all they're looking for is the best possible content in your niche. If you produce the best possible content in your niche, and then in your WordPress platform you add a, a, a plugin, it's a simple little plugin that everybody uses called Yoast SEO. And in that little plugin, there's four areas that you just put in your so-called keywords or interesting text that you want to sort of promote as representing the material on that page. You put that in there and then publish and that's it. So there's no real SEOing to do because over time, if you're publishing the best stuff in your niche, Google begin to recognize that you're the go-to place on the internet for this material. And so you put down in, in a, in a, into the web a sync of, of all, the, all the answers to all the questions that ever arise in that. And, and that means over time, you know, Google pick up on who's, who's trafficking, how long they're staying, well, what, what, the, what page they're moving from here to there. They can, they can analyze all of that. So if you've defined your taxonomy and then you answer questions for people in natural language and then you structure your Yoast SEO to reflect that natural language, publish, away you go. After two or three years, you know, I get content that's that's yeah, two or three years old. That's surfacing on page one, page two, every uh, page one every day for, for whatever query is being put that way. So you're always found. Yeah, yeah. 
And then with, with Facebook, it's just a question of choosing your ideal content and just boosting it. So an example of that is last week I did a post, it took me five, five months to, of being nagged by clients to say, right, that's enough. So I did a post that was called, you have been warned, the Hong Kong Immigration Department are now working to rule. And I laid out actually how people's expectations have been set by the Immigration Department of a four week case consideration time frame when in actual fact there's a 50% chance it's going to take about 12 weeks. Um, clients were nagging me about all the time, why is it taking so long, what's wrong with me, they don't like me, it's going to be denied, all the usual you know, fears that people have. So I thought, right, that's enough, I'm going to write a post on it. So I wrote the post on it, we got uh, uh, a pretty good woomph of, of organic traffic and then I put $190 into boosting that post on Facebook. Uh, and we've had, I think it was 63,000 exposures. We had 13,000 uh, uh, clicks out of it. So, you know, we really went into the, uh, the heart of where our community is and had a lot of shares of that, right? So that just reflects that there are people in, in Hong Kong that are waiting for the visas to be approved and they can't understand why long it's taking. And sort of, you know, within two or three days and less than 200 Hong Kong dollars, I've been able to get in front of everybody that's kind of got that problem and they can understand you know, where they are in it. And out of that, I've got the prospect of potentially having a relationship. Andrew. Well, uh, well thanks for much, Stephen. I, I can report I'm also a happy customer and I think it's a fantastic business model, I'm sure. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure that there is a lesson in your experience in Hong Kong that can go um, around the world. Um, I, I am a bit surprised by your emphasis of the word monopoly, which for me remains not entirely a good thing. Um, and uh, there are reasons why monopolies are discouraged by laws around the world. And um, not just the protection of sort of interests of customers, but also the interests of, of employees. And I'm sure that you yourself um, can be trusted with any organization that you're putting together, which is in that status. But really, is there an element I mean, do you think that the Hong Kong government or the immigration authority would like to have a monopoly company dealing with them in this regard? And do you think that, this, that the word monopoly is actually a good thing to be pushing? Well, okay, remember the implied in that question is this idea that, you know, monopoly is understood from the perspective of an industrial economy business or an industrial economy economy. So you think about the application of what I'm doing in my niche, and I'm laying claiming to the idea of monopoly. What am I actually claiming a monopoly over? What I'm doing is I'm giving away all the information that people need to be able to solve this problem for themselves completely for free. And then I'm giving them the opportunity, if they so wish, to buy a service off us that's completely down to them, um, where it's a completely risk-free proposition for them. Um, the question behind that then is, well, how can the monopoly like that be anti-consumer? I just think it's a controversial word, and I wouldn't be putting up a flag that says monopoly. Well, you see, you're, 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 you're a mathematician, logician, and I'm a lawyer, so I like to push it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, I just saw you have over 150,000 uh, clients. Tribe, our tribe is 150,000. Yes, yeah. uh, so with, uh, my question is based on the data. So, you know, uh, big data is a popular topic these days. So, have you think about any uh, more innovative business model? This, what I saw was uh, you probably is a commission based. Uh, business model? No, we sell services. Yes, so based on those uh, big data, how do you manipulate um, that and how will you uh, innovate some new business model based on so many data? Right, okay. I believe in growing the business organically, naturally, on the strength of relationships. Um, we have loads and loads and loads and loads of data. But, you know, we don't gather that data to benefit ourselves. We gather that data to do our job. 
So I just much prefer to work on uh, helping people to answer their questions and solve their problems and just publish like we do, create the relationships and that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me because anything outside of that is just a misuse of data. Clients don't have relationships with me to be able to you know, monetize or exploit what I've learned about them while I get them their visa. That's just not what we do. Um, but I, I understand the question and I know uh, there are important commercial opportunities within that. Does that mean that in future other applications of what we're doing in other niches wouldn't preclude a big data play? No, of course not. There's always opportunities like that. But in my niche, no, we won't be doing that. Hi. Um, question is, for a niche area like this, how do you begin pricing your services? Good question. Um, I mean, I know what the market price is all throughout, so I know my, my, my sector very well. Um, and I know what it costs us to deliver, uh, on average, a particular service. And so we have to have a benchmark price that uh, ultimately reflects our value in the marketplace. And I set that five years ago, six years ago, at 2,000 Hong Kong dollars an hour, um, which is good value, actually. Yeah. When was the last time you had to worry about a competitor? I've never worried about a competitor. Because we started from nothing there. Everyone was competing against us. But no, because I, I, know, I know they can't respond can't respond to what we're doing in the way that we're doing it um, and so they're selling the stuff that I was selling in 1996 um, so we've got some interesting things going on there are some it used to be in global immigration that they are, the contracts were awarded for national jurisdictions to a single point provider I was a founding partner in one of those businesses and I was I worked as the executive director for Asia Pacific markets for the other one uh, and I know what that RFP process is all about, and it's basically just commoditization, and it's just a race to the bottom, which I don't want to get involved in. Um, and the big RFP players, the big global players that, that, that look for immigration providers in those jurisdictions, are increasingly looking for interesting things in the marketplace. Now, actually, in my global marketplace, there's not that much interesting stuff going on. We're, we're completely maverick. Um, and so we, we're increasingly getting invited to participate in global RFPs that previously we weren't involved in because there is a rec recognition that things are changing. We should look at you know, what's out there at least to make some discoveries to see if there's something interesting. That's great for me because th that means I can have conversations and I can offer things that are completely outside the remit of what our, our major competitors offer. Uh, and I know they can't compete against them and I know I can deliver value in new and interesting ways and I can deliver value where I still maintain our margins of $2,000 an hour uh, and, and out-compete them on, on every front including price. So you shift the market from under the feet of your competition. You hear a great deal about content marketing. Well, the, the problem with that concept of content marketing because nobody really knows what it means because content is anything and marketing is marketing. Um, and I think that the whole notion of content marketing as it's, as it's presently understood by organizations such as the Content Marketing Institute, I think, uh, I think they've got it wrong. Because I don't think you can take an industrial economy business and then decide to come up with some sort of content strategy and then apply that so-called content strategy to that industrial economy business model and then expect to get econ connection economy type results. I don't think you can do that. Uh, in my first, well, one of my other businesses, Orla, I learned uh, that, you know, you, especially in corporations, you can't expect people, organizations to change it the way they operate just because you've got a really good idea and, you, in, and you, you're convinced that it's going to work. So I don't believe in this notion of content marketing. What I believe in is something called intelligent content marketing. And what that means is that you uh, assess your marketplace and then you decide, right, okay, what does that future market look like? Or what do I think it looks like? And then you inject these particular elements. So uh, your business model that results from this new thinking comprises enabling technology, high quality content platform, disruptive service design, like a, in our case a purple cow, value-laden price and science of persuasion, an irresistible offer, generating a tribe, 
inculcating an idea virus, reversing the risk that you've got with the customer, and then in your content platform, produce your content in such a way so that you can map the knowledge graph and dominate search. And you use content to drive the actual strategic messaging and also do the educating that you need to do to achieve these kind of outcomes. So if you do a, a sort of a deep dive of what we've done at the Hong Kong Visa Centre, you see that we've got all these elements in place. And if you've got these elements in place and then generate content to proper, propagate that um, proposition, then you know, it will, the marketplace will begin to organise itself around you. The, be the best way to market a business is to tell the story of the business, and that's what I'm doing today. Money back? Is that, yeah. Yeah. People take drop on that, actually. Big pardon? People take drop on that. Oh, it, it's come standard with the service. Every, every, everybody that we take on as a platinum service client gets a 200% money back guarantee. How many times have you given the money back? Three or four, I think. Just the cost of marketing, right? And and I think in half of those instances, they made recommendations to uh, their friends to come and see us, right? You can't lose. It's counterintuitive, but you can't lose. So the way that you think you can apply some of your thinking to like news media that's entirely struggling with the way that they market content and journalism? Well, the problem with the problem with news media is what are they selling, right? They've got, to, they've, got to, they've got to find some interesting ways to monetize what they sell. Um, uh, and I've done some thinking about that in the context of the South China Morning Post before SCMP was, was bought by Jack Ma. Um, I thought, well, the problem with the SCMP today is they don't realize what their role is. Their role is not to disseminate news about Hong Kong. Their role is actually to be the custodians of social history. And if they, you know, approach what they did from that perspective and then think about monetizing their content around that perspective, you know, uh, then new opportunities emerge for that business. But, you know, I've been here 30 years and I remember, you know, you used to, you used to have to cost, you used to cost you a couple of thousand dollars for a small advertisement in the South Carolina Morning Post on a Saturday and they were this thick. You know, it was an absolute license to print money for that family. Uh, and then, like every, every, every news media organization, just watch their market just drip away and no idea how to respond to it. And I still don't think they've cracked it. Hi. Thank you for, for your sharing, Stephen. I have a question with regards to your sort of views, regards to steady organic business growth compared to high growth uh, scalability, because we have arguably an even bigger tribe just across the border, where information and, and, and this type of information is extremely scarce and confusing. I mean, arguably, if, if one does their research and understands that particular space, you could transfer this model into that particular tribe. But it, it probably wouldn't fit into the steady business growth sort of description, perhaps. Uh, well, in, in terms of the uh, applicability of what I'm doing here into the China market, yeah. well, what am I selling into the China market? Because I can't sell Hong Kong residency, really, because they stopped the key program that brought most Chinese people here over the last 10 years. That was stopped a couple of years ago. And the only other way that you can do it is very complicated. Uh, involves uh, a lot of provision of a lot of paper and a lot of transparency and f unfortunately I've learned that mainlanders basically are only interested in doing the minimum amount that they can for the minimum amount of, for amount of money that they need to pay uh, and basically have everybody do the running around for them. Well, I can't deliver any value in that environment so I, I, they're not clients for me. I can't get anything for them. This is ironic, right, because I know that there are parties north of the boundary that are offering all kinds of immigration solutions to very wealthy Chinese and coming up with all kinds of harebrained schemes. Um, actually, I mean, I know how to do it, and these people, these clients, I could absolutely do it for them, but I haven't got access to them because of the way that the market works. Um, and to be honest, it's just, they're just too hard to deal with. So you've got, you know, the prospect market, but every time I've tried to do anything in China, I've lost my share, so. I was kind of thinking of the reverse, i.e., 
there's probably you know sort of people outside of China who might want to be doing business or having some sort of a visa service in China. I see. And and so therefore the model of providing the information and then providing the advice might be applicable. This is, this uh, I can assure you, if it's immigration related, this this will work in, in any jurisdiction, in any marketplace. Immigration is all about the same thing, you're selling peace of mind. So yeah. Um, and I've been very transparent, but I don't see any of my major competitors adopting these techniques yet. And you have to become a publisher when you get right down to it. And if you're successful at doing immigration one particular way, it, it, it's, it's a very brave step, right, to suddenly decide, well, now I'm going to produce high quality content and, you know, deal with guys that, you know, running around with cameras and what do I look like? It's, it's just hard work, I think. But yeah. Anybody could, uh, anybody who knows immigration and can position themselves as being an expert in it could apply this in any jurisdiction, no doubt about it. Tom. You say that there's a degree of transparency that's actually needed on the immigration authority side to allow a model like this to succeed? Because I mean, the, the case in China is that they just don't tell anybody anything. So like anybody who's trying to be an immigration consultant is basically just lying to you because they don't have any better <laughs> idea than you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and uh, I mean, fortunately in Hong Kong, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the perfect position because the immigration department's website is rubbish. I mean, from a usability perspective, the u what does the user want out of it? It's rubbish. But then again, you shouldn't expect it to be anything else because the immigration job is to decide and uh, uh, inform. It's not to advise. So that's where we fit in, right in the middle. So. Um, and you know we don't make any claims that are, are untrue in terms of you know our relationship with the immigration department or you know what our expertise means in terms of being able to deliver uh, a service that's better than anybody else's. It's just a case of let people see for themselves. And I think the immigration department see that. Actually, I think the immigration department, if you look at what we do, we, we actually promote the rule of law, where we're very uh, very transparent about how people who are breaching the conditions of stay, shouldn't breach the conditions of stay, and these are the reasons why, and this is how you go about fixing it. So you don't really have any excuse, do you, anymore? So I suspect from that perspective, the immigration department don't have a problem, problem with us. I would hope they didn't, anyway. Tom? In terms of competition, you talked about established players. It's going to be very difficult for them to change their business model yeah. to start competing with you in terms of producing content. What about giving potential competitors everything they need to compete and sort of follow your business model. How do you how do you deal with that? Well you can't, right? If somebody wanted to come along and basically take our complete content platform and say everything that's been said here we're going to say in a different way and present it in a different way, we're going to basically re engineer it, uh, where there hasn't been any breach formal breach of copyright. Nothing I can do. It just boils down to credibility. So yeah. Do you currently use any CRM tools to manage the relationship with the tribe? No, we have, all, we have, our, our, we have our house developed technology. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite, down the years we learned that actually the stuff that Martin and I know, nobody else knows. So, and because we're, we've been developing technology for 20 odd years, we never thought about using anybody else's tool. Just let's just build something that we know is perfectly applicable to all professional service areas. It's not just immigration. And do you think there is anything which can be extracted from the knowledge mapping process in terms of the methodology to be able to apply to other areas? Because that kind of comprehensive task is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but it's an investment, right? So worth doing. Uh, just lay down the equivalency of the Hong Kong Visa Handbook, which is the definitive sort of Bible of knowledge in that particular niche. Uh, and then once you've exhausted your own intellectual capabilities and how you think you can sort of represent that or articulate that, then reach out to the tribe and say, well, ask me questions about it. And then that way you, you sort of ever widen the knowledge graph and you end up with this sort of pool of knowledge. Uh, and I think that's the only way that you can do it, really. And then it grows a pair of legs on its own over time and it goes off and does what it does. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to the same thing, which is the go-to place for information on this stuff. I mean, just from the consulting side, I mean, there's lots of businesses that 
pay for people to produce content for them, whether it's on websites or social media or whatever, but they lack the actual comprehensive understanding of what, what the their content is creating out, yeah. out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your attention this evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.